Hey, um, welcome. It's Mark Littlewood from the Business of Software, and this is the first Google Hangout um, for talks from Business of Software USA 2015. I'm joined today um, by two very interesting people. Uh, firstly, David Heinemeiner Hansen. Say hi. Hello. Um, David, um, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, is the creator of Ruby on Rails, uh, is the co-founder of Basecamp, and started to learn to drive racing cars how many years ago? Eight? Yeah, something like that. Eight. And uh, now you're a, Lo a Le Mans winner, so um, quite annoying because movie star good looks, um, all of that kind of stuff, and uh, just the sort of person that you really would like to not like, but uh, we can't help um, but thinking he's a great guy. And also, another great guy um, over in Bologna, um, this is Peldi. Hello, everyone. Tell us about yourself, Peldi. Uh, I run a little software company called Balsamic, and uh, I am here to uh, try to ask some questions to David. Uh, but I'm totally intimidated because he is really good at arguing with people. <laughs> See, all, all my time on Twitter has been uh, well spent. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, David, tell us about, so you talked about, uh, your talk was titled Rewrite. Um, gave it at, uh, you, you were the opening uh, keynote at uh, Business Software this year. Um, what was the thinking behind the talk? Because this is a new thing and it's really been kind of born out of your experiences of rewriting the code base at, at uh, Basecamp three times. Yeah, so we're in the 12th year of uh, Basecamp now. Um, well, the 12th year of working on it. We started working on it in 2003, and um, that's longer than I think most people have been working on their SaaS software. Um, there's a lot of information out there around how do you start a new company, uh, how do you start a SaaS software product, how do you deal with all that stuff? We've been putting out a bunch of it. Um, rework was a lot about how do you get started and what do you need to look out for and so forth. But I think now we're entering a phase with Basecamp where both as the product and as the company, we've been around for a long time, um, at least in internet years. 12 years is a very long time, which presents us with some new challenges that we just didn't have before. And I think it was just interesting for me to realize that some of the ideas that I held dear early on in the life cycle of Basecamp and in my career weren't holding up for the long term. Um, not to say that like everything I knew was wrong, but there were some things I knew that were wrong, and those are the most dangerous things. The things you know that aren't so, I think it's a famous saying. So what we knew that wasn't so was this notion of uh, the eternal code base, uh, transcendent software that we could just keep uh, working on Basecamp, the original code base, forever, and that that would be a good experience. Turned out that it wasn't. We rewrote Basecamp the first time um, seven years after we launched it, and now we have, for the, the second time, uh, rewritten the whole thing from scratch. Um, started with Rails' new Basecamp, uh, or BC3, actually, as we call it. Uh, and build everything up again. Like started with a clean slate in terms of the user experience, in terms of the features we wanted in the product, and basically just take everything that we'd learned over those, well, we started on BC3 almost two years ago. So 10 years of running Basecamp, we took all that and thought, what were all the things we would do different? And put that into a, into a brand new code base, into a brand new product, and, and we're just on the cusp of releasing that. And through that whole process, I just, I came to a bunch of new conclusions. So I wanted really to get that information out there because uh, it seems like today the standard notion of how you deal with rewrites and so on is still wrapped in this idea of technical debt. And that was what I was sort of trying to explore, that there are other reasons to rewrite your software than just going technically bankrupt on the um, implementation. And. Uh, there's a few. There's a few people that have watched this talk and come back to me with a number of, of um, questions, which I'll, I'll, I'll come back to on about 
if you're spending years, you've built a code base, you've then spent a long time tweaking it and fixing bugs and this, that, and the other, aren't you running the risk of creating just a whole new set of bugs and, uh, and things like that? But um, I'd just like to, to add that if people want to ask questions here, um, in the top right-hand corner of your screen, if you're watching, there should be a Q&A button, um, and you can ask questions. Uh, James McClave has already asked a question, which is more of a statement, but I'll let this one go. Uh, been looking forward to this. So uh, welcome, James. Um, Peldy. Yeah, hi. So um, I have a, you know, I'm going to skip uh, all the softball questions because I think uh, we'll try to get to the, to the real meat right away. So I, uh, I really like your talk, and as often, we are uh, very much inspired by you guys, and, and we're, we're in the process of doing something similar ourselves. So I have a set of questions that actually maybe I want to ask you separately that will help me specifically during my thing. But we'll get maybe there's time we'll get to those. So the first question though is, yes, the rewrite is uh, a good thing in your in your view, but it takes a long time, right? It took uh, you said it took about two years to uh, to to work on B on uh, on uh, Basecamp three. Uh, the first question is, um, how much of your team works on the new stuff versus the uh, the old stuff? Yeah, so the current stuff, when we get started on the new rewrite, since we've been through it twice now, I think the key thing that we've learned is that start with as few people as possible. Nice. Um, for us, that's usually around three people, uh, two designers and just me on programming. And the reason that works well in the beginning is you don't know what you're building. And until you know what you're building, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a lot of people on it. Um, so we kind of uh, just from the beginning said, well, let's just have a small team playing with ideas. Because the thing with starting a rewrite is it's not really... Um, this is kind of distracting. People are jumping. I'm sorry, I, I'm not quite sure what's happened here. I think we've. Uh, possibly I think the, the live session here is. Uh, but okay. not. Anyway, I, I'll tr I'll carry on here. Um, I'll actually just hide the screen so I'll talk without looking at a thousand faces. <laughs> um, now I'm looking at uh, El Capitan Mountain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what we're saying was um, small team. Be, okay. you know, until you figure out what's going on and what you want to build and how you're going to build it, it just doesn't make sense to involve the whole company. Doubly so, because you still have a product. Um, even though we started in the first phases of building it two years ago, uh, we couldn't just stop working on the current version of Basecamp. Right. Like, if we had just done nothing for two years, uh, no new features, no improvements, and so on, that would have been a terrible waste, and our existing customers would not have been happy about that at all. So I think the key is to take a Splinter group, um, sequester them somewhat from the operations of every day running, and give them the freedom to explore what that looks like. So when I say we started two years ago, what we started on two years ago was the initial design explorations. And I think we went through at least two of those that got to a fair level of fidelity on the design phase that we then decided that's not the right direction for Basecamp. And then we pulled things back and we started on another direction that we then finally got enough confidence in to think, okay, there's something here. Let's try to build something. So that was when I jumped in on the technical side of things and said, uh, the first step was actually, could we reuse what we have? These design ideas, can they be reused to a point where we can use the existing code base, maybe just make a duplicate of the existing code base and start tweaking things? And that was the first... Two, two weeks of the technical exploration was me trying to retrofit the new ideas onto the old, as we called it, chassis. And we quickly realized that that old chassis was just not going to hold up for what we wanted to do with the new design. So that's what led me to basically say, okay, nope, let's just start from scratch. And that was maybe, let's see, a year and a half ago, a little more than that, I think, um, where we got started with what ended up being the final code base. Got it. And then we had a very slow roll-on, too, I'd say. It's not just like, hey, you figure out what you want to build, and then boom, everyone is on it. Um, we started adding people very sort of slowly and methodically. First, add one, two people, then add a few more people, and it wasn't really until maybe 
six months ago, where we said, okay, we're now fully committed to this version of what we're building. Let's get everyone on it. And that's when we stopped working on new features for the existing version of Basecamp. Uh, okay, so now um, if there's a if there's a problem with the current uh, with Basecamp two, uh, who jumps on it? Is there one dedicated person that is like legacy person or or anyone who knows that code because they originally wrote it? How, how does it work? So we have what we call on call, which is. Uh, Every programmer um, will rotate through on call and they'll be on it for one week and their responsibility on on call is to fix all the things that come up by customers issues in the system. Uh, customers might be finding bugs or they might be finding other edge cases that we haven't fixed so they have to deal with the data. But it's something sort of everyone cycles through. Got it. On top of that, I mean, occasionally we will have things, somebody on on-call will stumble into something that's a bigger deal than what they can fix within that week, and then they just have to pull someone in. And it always takes precedence. Like, the new product never takes precedent. We have to service the existing customers that we have first. So it's not like somebody hits a bug and it's like, hey, sorry guys, uh, we're in right. DC3 <laughs> mode. Like, you're going right. to have to live with that for the next right. six months. That's... Right. That's, That's one of the job, yes. one of the, the, the beautiful things about not having outside investors or you know deadlines. The, the new stuff can wait. Um, the stuff that's bringing in the money is uh, is always more important. Now, so where you when you're in the middle of the old and new, um, do you ever have to duplicate the same feature on both code bases? Because you think like, okay, it's a good feature for the current, but also by the way, this is going to be important for the future as well. How does that work? We thought about that, actually. So we've spent a, about a year building a brand new uh, text editor called Trix, which is this uh, from the ground up rewrite um, that doesn't use content editable uh, that almost every other text editor, TinyMC, and, and all the others use because we wanted more control and we wanted a better editing experience. And the initial idea was that we were going to introduce that new text editor on on both platforms, on both the current version of Basecamp and the new version of Basecamp. But it's just, it didn't pan out that way. It panned out the way where once the momentum had shifted to BC3, um, the amount of things we were fixing on the, on the current version of Basecamp, they kind of, they took a step back in ambition, that we weren't going to try to make major new things that required big migrations and so on, as introducing a brand new text editor would, because we'd have to update all the existing text that we had in the database or, or deal with ways to make them coexist. Um, so we, we basically just decided we're just not going to do that. So there was not a whole lot of concurrent development where um, we were trying to introduce the same feature in both platforms. Although some of the smaller features that we introduced in the current version of Basecamp, uh, which were very well received, those actually in some instances haven't made it to the new version of, uh, of Basecamp yet. So there's always going to be like a little bit of weirdness there. There's going to be different priorities on what features make sense to push where and when. But I'd say our level of ambition for the current version of Basecamp shrunk considerably once we had a good platform. Once we were using Basecamp 3 ourselves, which we've been using ourselves for, let's see, maybe nine months. The company internally has been on the new version of Basecamp for maybe nine months. I don't actually remember that precisely. So that's just kind of a guess. But once we sw switched over and we were using Basecamp 3 primarily to do our own work, well, that's kind of where the level of ambition went and where the interest went. So it's pretty important that you don't do that too early because it's pretty easy to, then once you've lived in your new sparkling code base and your new sparkling product, to be kind of down on the existing version. I don't think there's anyone who creates a brand new, this is the best ideas that we have version of their product and then still think that the old version, ah, it's just as good, we could just as well be using that. No, of course not. You actually get really <laughs> impatient. And I think perhaps that's a good driver too. So when we started nine months ago to use that version of Basecamp 3 internally, it didn't take very long until we were like, oh my god, this is so much better. I want this out there. I want this to be our product in the marketplace. I don't want to keep selling the old version. So I think it helped build up that level of um, urgency which is important to finish anything. Because one of the problems with making a new version is this notion of second system syndrome, or in our case, third 
system syndrome, where you kind of think, oh, we're going to fix every single bug, every single edge case, every single feature that any customer has ever asked for is going to be in the new brand version, right? Which is a great way to embark on a five-year marathon project that's then going to be canceled under its own weight in the end. It just doesn't work like that. Even yeah. though you're making a brand new version with your best ideas, you still have to make compromises. You still have to do trade-offs. You can't have it all in there. And to make those trade-offs, I think you need a sense of urgency. Right. It's, it's hard to otherwise say, oh, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, what is the saying from games development? When it's done, right? Like, that's how you end up with Duke Nukem Forever, <laughs> where it just takes 11 <laughs> years, and then when it comes out, it's completely underwhelming. Or what was that Guns N' Roses guy that put out a new album that took 10 years, and it's just like, eh, nothing so, is that good. Nothing is worth waiting 10 years on unless it's a fucking Hoover Dam or something. <laughs> so you decided in about six months where the current uh, product is fully in maintenance mode before you release yes. the new one? Right. Okay, so a question about those six months is that, Mark, can you mute? It's making a lot of money. Um, a question about those six months is that, sure, easy enough for you guys to say, because you've been around 12, 12 years and you have giant checks coming in month after month. That's a, that's a luxury, right? Not a lot of people are in that, in, in that um, position where they can just basically stop fixing things, or you know, other than major things or security things, stop adding features and uh, people will just continue to stick around? Or do you think that that, that will happen regardless because of the nature of the I, I think I think that whole questioning goes to the insecurities that most software developers have around their product because they're so close to it that they think like, oh, if we don't improve the product for just six months, as you say, the world is going to end and people are going to flee to another competing product. Not how the world works. It, it just isn't. Nobody cares that much. Um, nobody cares that much about uh, sort of a minor temporary stop in the introduction of new features. In fact, um, we've had customers from time to time who sort of been like, hey, don't change things too fast. So I think the natural tendency is for makers to think, oh, I have to keep tweaking, I have to keep improving at this rapid race, uh, rate, otherwise people are gonna, they're gonna go away. No, they're not. Like, there are plenty of major software packages that um, don't see any changes for a year. Like iOS is kind of on a yearly schedule. Uh, OS X is on a yearly schedule. Plenty of other pieces of software are on multi-year schedules. Right. It's I agree. This is it's interesting to me because with this. oh, we can update it at any moment. So if we don't update it at all the moments, we're failing. That's yeah. What's very right. interesting to me is that the way you're going towards, which is you know, one major release every couple of years, and then little small things. That's how it, uh, I used to know that the software world worked when I worked at Adobe, right? We were 18 month re release cycle, and then the CD was, shipped, was yep. shipped, and that was it. For 18 months, you got nothing else, right? Um, totally. and, and I think I think that now that. the world of SaaS is kind of moving towards that. Yes, and I think that's one of those uh, sort of funny twists where you go like, oh, yay, we have the freedom to do anything, so we should. And then you realize, oh, no, wait a minute. Like, those constraints of the old world, the constraints of having to burn gold masters and not being able to send them out all the time, maybe they were actually good constraints. And it's funny because I particularly remember it from the gaming world where there was all this about, like, oh, well, when the gold masters cut, like, the product has to be pretty damn good. Um, look at games these days. Wasn't, didn't EA just uh, retract the game from the marketplace because they put out such a shitty version because they thought, eh, it doesn't matter what the quality is. We can just keep updating it after it gets out there, right? I think it leads to this sloppy thinking that, um, well, you can just change anything at any time. Quality kind of doesn't matter that much. Um, and you end up in a place that's worse. So, yes, you have less constraints, but those fewer constraints lead you to be just a slob and... Customers are not better off for it. Again, that's putting things a little bit on an edge because, of course, there are benefits to being able to update critical bugs after something shipped, right? But I think the whole uh, approach to it, it changed too much. We went too much in the direction of just, oh, we can change anything at any time, therefore we should, where we've learned that um, there is actually great advantage to just saying, 
hey, let's take a step back. Let's work for a longer period of time on a major revision, on a major upgrade, which is not the right thing to do when you just want to add a single feature, which is why when you say, oh, we do this every couple of years, it's not entirely true. Like, we started version working on the... Um, uh, first or the first rewrite of Basecamp maybe like four and a half years ago. So the current version of Basecamp we're selling is more like four and a half year old ideas, right? Um, which is, that's a long time. I mean, four or five years between uh, major product releases, that feels right to our business. Um, may depend on your industry and, and how that moves. And, and maybe you don't have that many new ideas that warrant this radical rewrite of the whole thing that often. Maybe that's something you do once every 10 years. Uh, the main point of my talk was to basically open people's mind to that being an option. Because a lot of people had taken that option entirely off the table uh, and thought of, well, rewrites is only for technical bankruptcies. They're not for rejigging the product. Right. So let's get to the let's get to the, the one part that was the most scary uh, about your talk, which is the Louis C.K. You have to make a void. Uh, you can't reuse any of that code that you know, as Joel said, has all the history baked in it. All those little bugs that were fixed. Yeah. Like throwing all of that away, and then you do it again after a few years. And so, first of all. Why? That seems uh, crazy. Uh, and um, and also, every five years, it's not just the design ideas, the vision for the product that changes, but the technology uh, world every five years is, is a major new thing. So, um, so I guess I have another question is why throw it away and does the change in technology uh, uh, affect your decision to say, hey, maybe we should start over because now we could do it so much faster, so much better because of these new technologies. Yeah, so for the first question, why throw it all away? I think if you're not throwing it all away, you're not changing enough and it's not worth it and you shouldn't be throwing it away. I think that's where Joel's point makes sense. Like if you're basically, again, it goes back to the technical debt thing, right? Like if you're basically just uh, wanting to throw away your code base because your programmers are kind of sick and tired of the technology stack that it's based on or whatever, I think you should be extremely hesitant about that. Uh, more likely than not, that is a poor idea and not something you should be doing. And that's why he's right. Where it fails is um, if you don't do that, if you don't have that option on the table, I don't think you're going to think freely enough. Like the metaphor that I was using was... Uh, uh, if your current software is a, is a table and you want to make a chair, yeah, there is a path where you can hack and slash or add on to a table and turn it into a chair, but it's going to be a shitty chair. It's not going to be a chair you're proud of. So don't do that. Like, okay, if but what do you, you want rewrite, a slightly better table? Then but, but do you start from zero, like rewriting um, user authentication? Um, um, right? So some things, in our case, we have shared systems that are not tied to the existing app. We, for example, have a federal ID called the 37ID that we used across all our applications, high rise and backpack and campfire and so on. So we've leaned on those systems to some extent. But every single system that was in the current version of Basecamp, Basecamp 2, let's just call that to be clear, everything that was in, the, in Basecamp 2, we basically didn't port over uh, until we had to or until we knew that there were, oh, that subsystem needs no changes. It's not like you can't copy code at all. It's just that it shouldn't be your go-to. You should not just, like, duplicate the current repository and then just start tweaking in there. Okay. I mean, you can do that okay. while okay. you're sort of figuring out whether it's worth doing a rewrite at all. As I said, that's what we actually did with Basecamp 3. I did a, a, a branch of Basecamp 2 and tried to hack and slash in that right. branch to figure out whether I could twist Basecamp 2 into fulfilling the things we needed for Basecamp 3, and I couldn't. I couldn't do that in a way where I felt good about it, right? It very quickly turned out to be um, that add-on high chair to the table instead of my beautiful new Stingray. Got so, it. So, so instead of taking and refactoring, start from zero and copy over things that you need and only the parts that you need. Once you've committed to this is going to be a new product, this is going to be a new twist, this is not going to be a slight tweak. I think that is where sort of, it separates the waters. If, if you just don't have enough new ideas that are radical enough that um, sort of it's going to be a brand new product, 
well, then you shouldn't be doing all this. It's an immense amount of work. It's absolutely not worth doing. It's not worth putting your customers through it. It's not worth any of these things if what you're putting out is not substantially and significantly different than what you have. And if it is substantially and significantly different, it will also be clear that the same code base can't fulfill that purpose. Right. Um, so for me, it was never about technology. Technology was the side effect and the sort of cherry on cake. Oh, since we're starting from scratch anyway, because we want a different product, we want a different take on the same product, we can use the latest and greatest now. And I mean, I won't hide that that's, a, for me, a, a very rewarding side effect of this whole thing, because there's nothing that sort of gets me more excited about moving Rails forward than just starting from a clean slate and just um, uh, saying, OK, let's use the latest. Let's use WebSockets for chat. Let's use um, um, job services a lot more. Let's put in Redis in a bunch of places. Let use all the, the best and the greatest that we can currently do. Let's rewrite Turbolinks from scratch and make a version that works beautifully across mobile devices as well. Uh, we had a lot of freedom to do those things because we were starting from scratch, and, and that worked out well. Um, but it shouldn't be the driver. Unless you're, again, unless you're rewriting because of a technical bankruptcy, and then right. you should be extremely skeptical about doing that. That's usually just programmers saying, I don't want to touch code I haven't written myself. Um, that's the point Joel is making, right? right. But there's also this in institutional knowledge in the code base, and all this sort of seemingly ugly code is ugly because of a reason. It got there one step at a time, and it got there for fixing bugs and so forth. So if you just throw all that out, you're going to end up with a worse for the customer product. Um, all this shit is only worth it if you're making a new, different product. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's something about you, David, and I think Jason. Neither of you really get very excited by small problems, small challenges. Nope. Um, you want nope. something I, let big. Let me just refute that right there. <laughs> let me just refute that because it's funny. I get exceptionally excited about small tweaks when they have impact. So what I don't get excited about is changing things that don't matter. Like once we get to the point where the changes will have no impact, um, yeah, then I'm bored. But there's a lot of small changes. I'd actually say many of the sort of uh, those things that put the biggest smile on my lips is when we take a, a line of copy, a sentence, and tweak it just ever so slightly, and all of a sudden it's clear. I go like, fuck, that's awesome. And I do that in code all the time, too. I think some people yeah. are absolutely addicted to the Greenfield experience of, let me build this major new castle from scratch. And that is, that's the appeal of it. I just, just want to say that that's not where, where I'm coming at from. I, just, I want to make sure that like, impact per minute is high enough to sustain things. Like it, if I could just as well not be there, yeah, I'm not interested. Like that, that doesn't sustain my motivation. Um, but as long as I'm there and making a difference, it doesn't even matter how small the change is. Some of the things, it's funny, some of the things we celebrate the most internally in Basecamp is perhaps we'll put in some major new feature, right? And it'll take a long time to build that feature, and we'll start working on it and working with it, and we're like, eh, it's not quite right. So we rip the feature out, right? Like, that's zero work. It's like almost nothing. And the cheers that we can conjure internally when we rip out an unlike feature it's louder than anything else, pretty much, right? Like we all go, yes, this fucking feature that we kind of ended up hating is dead. Woohoo! Right? So that's not a, like, there's not a great deal of technical insight required to deleting code, but oh my god, is it sweet and satisfying. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, the other, other question I had there is, have you ever been tempted to come up with a new Ruby? What would your new thing be? Yeah, so uh, in terms of programming, it's funny because um, I wonder how to put this, but I, I'm not interested in programming languages in the same way that some other programmers are interested in programming languages. So uh, some programmers, they just enjoy learning a bunch of different programming languages because it does give them a different perspective, and that's like a fun thing for them, right? I don't fall in that camp. Like, I found Ruby now. And Ruby continues to amaze me, and I continue to be able to bend it in ways that, that I enjoy, where I haven't run out of steam there. So I'm, I'm not in the market. Let's, let's put it like that, right? Like, I'm not a programmer who's in the market for a new programming language, because the current programming language that I have has not exceeded my capabilities, my interests, my motivations. 
um, which is like that's the perfect spot you want to keep your customers, right? You want to keep your customers on a product that fulfills all those things where they're not even in the market. Like uh, I'll occasionally look at other program languages. I looked at, at, at Swift. I've looked at some of the functional stuff and like, oh, yeah, that's great. I can take a few ideas and, and incorporate it, but I've never ended up really building anything in Anchor with them because I haven't needed to. The domain that I am in is so beautifully suited for Ruby. Ruby is just such a perfect fit for uh, web applications. Um, the large, broad swath of that work, at least, that um, not in the market, so I just don't care. That doesn't mean I don't care about the technology. I care exceedingly about the technology. Like I spend so much time improving Rails still to make it current and fit the challenges that we're facing when we're building a brand new, from scratch, modern, even though I kind of hate that term, application that's trying to use the latest and the greatest, right? So keeping up with all that and making that better, that's very rewarding. But, um, yeah, I, in some ways it's surprising, right? Like if you had asked me 12, 13 years ago, are you still going to be programming Rails and Ruby now? I'd say no. Like There's going to be something else that's better that will have come out and, and change things. And that's one of the things where I've realized over those, what, 15 years or so I've been doing this, that... Something seems to change very quickly, right? So we have this tendency in technology to paint that as a broad brush that technology is moving at this incredible space or pace. If you're not um, keeping up every damn second of it, you're going to miss it. Six months? Oh, man, we're using entirely different JavaScript libraries now. Yeah, you have a lot of churn in very sort of isolated little pockets, and then there's tons of shit that just stays the same. Ruby today... <laughs> If you look at the Ruby we're working with today versus the Ruby that started in, what, 93 or whatever, right? Like, more than 20 years, they would look almost identical. Like, the things we've tweaked are really at the edges. Those major breakthroughs just don't come along that often. Um, and for me, even looking at all this stuff and paying an obscene amount of attention to it and experimenting with things, I just haven't, like, there hasn't been this breakthrough through that said, like, oh, let's throw out everything we know because the technology base has changed. And I think the reason for that is that the deployment platform hasn't changed. As long as we're still delivering HTML, which is and CSS, like, all those things gotten better, JavaScript gotten better, but they're still very much the same kinds of things that we've been working with for the past 20 years. So the tools to produce those things are also similar. And for me, in a joyous way, not as in like, oh, shoot, i got to work with this fucking stupid Ruby again. You can work with whatever. We just rewrote it from scratch. When you rewrite a new application from scratch, you are totally eligible to go back in the market and say, let's use new technology. You, there's nothing that would have kept us on Ruby. There's nothing that would have kept us on Rails for Basecamp 3 if we hadn't said and decided, hey, this is what we want. We're picking Ruby and Rails right now because that's going to be the best environment for us for the brand new version of Basecamp, and we can pick from any shelf in the store. It always entertains me to see you and uh, Toby from Shopify actually swapping messages on Twitter. I think there was a, a thing recently about um, scalability, and um, I think you were doing a bit of showing off, weren't you, David? And then Toby came back and slightly trumped you. Um, oh, he trumped me big time. <laughs> Which is, is a great, I, I love yeah, that. I love that. I love it. Mean, there's a sort of a, a degree of, um, of competition. Are, are there any other organizations that are using, using it at that sort of scale? I and mean, what, 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 uh, what's the limit? So it's funny because it's rare that we hear about these things, right? Like the first time I actually heard about uh, Shopify doing, what was it, 17,000 Rails requests a second or something. I went like, holy shit, that's a large number. And again, I understand it's not a large number in, in web scale. Uh, and by web scale, I mean like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram or whatever. Some of these things that have uh, like many hundreds of millions of users, they're going to have complete different usage numbers, right? But I found it interesting that both for, for Shopify, now a public company um, doing very well, like I don't know how many stores they have, but... Long history, they've been around almost as long as, uh, as Basecamp has. Same thing for Basecamp, right? Like, both of these things are major, incredibly successful uh, software companies. And these are the limits we're hitting, and they're not just... Like, <laughs> actually, the, the biggest compliment that I got on that whole thread was the people saying, that's fucking nothing. Like, that's nothing. Like, 2,000 requests a second, that's nothing. Don't you know that's nothing? And I just go like, wow, isn't this amazing that we can build this 
fantastic business, and we're not even tapping into close to the cutting edge of what um, uh, scalability issues are like these days. I love that. I love that it's not me. I love that fucking Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and whoever else are at the vanguard dealing with these issues such that their progress on, on some of the infrastructure level things, they just trickle down to the rest of us and we never have to deal with it. Um, some people see that and like, oh, that means like your little toy app is, is somebody actually called Basecamp a toy app. I thought that was awesome. Um, <laughs> that the Basecamp toy app um, sort of is kind of a pathetic thing we should be ashamed of. And I just go like, dude, Basecamp is more successful than like 99.5% of every hosted internet application ever launched. So if, if Rails and Ruby is a perfect fit for like the 99.9%, hey, that's fantastic. I could not get a better endorsement than saying, oh, your framework is not the right thing for the 0.1% of us. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> if you're in the 0.1%, I mean, fuck, go off, build your own rocket ship. That's totally fine. <laughs> you don't have to share, share parts with the rest of us. Um, but for the rest of us, it kind of matters that we're collaborating about building these rocket ships because it's a tremendous amount of work. I mean, we spend over a decade honing and improving uh, Rails to get to the point where somebody could call Basecamp a toy app, right? Because it's not doing anything interesting and, and the amount of scale that it's sustaining is uninteresting. Wow, could you imagine better compliments? And a more positive view for anyone starting a company today. Like if you're launching a new application today and you can look at Basecamp and see like, fuck, with all their success and they're 12 years in business, they're not even scratching the surface of what's hard to scale. Boom, scaling solved for me. Like the odds of me turning into to the Facebooks and um, Twitters of the world that need to do pioneering work at the infrastructure level is non-existent. Bigger chance of being fucking struck by lightning while you're holding a Powerball winning lottery ticket while you slip in a banana peel, right? So fantastic. I think it, it's such a positive message for everyone building software today. Okay, fantastic. A, a few questions coming in. I'm going to pick on a, a, a few here. So there's a Newella Rhodes um, who says, how much customer input do you get when building this major release? Seems like a similar type of waterfall method to building new products. Seems like the day-to-day -day could be agile. Yep, so what we get is uh, we keep saying secret, right? We've only just started talking <laughs> about Basecamp 3, like, what, in the past two months or so while we've been building it for two years. And I think that's part of the, the trick here. If you announced, if we had announced two years ago, hey, we're building a brand new version of Basecamp, well, first of all, we were going to run the risk of us spawning ourselves, which is announcing a new major version of your product while expecting customers to continue to buy your old product for the next two years. That's just a bad idea. Don't do that. Um, so that also means that the level of input we're getting to the new version of Basecamp is based on the old version of Basecamp. And we get tons of input every day. I think we're getting, what are we getting, 600 emails a day from customers. A uh, good amount of those include various suggestions and then how we could improve the software to fit them better. The key is to work on these people's behalf, not on their requests. We get requests almost exclusively in terms of, hey, can you add this button here? Can you tweak this feature here? Can you have this view? Can you do these other things? People are not describing their problems. You have to dig to uncover their problems. And uncovering problems is how you can solve whole categories of issues for different people at the same time. So if you just counted raw feature requests for Basecamp, you probably have thousands. There's no way we can fulfill thousands of feature requests and do a good job of that and come out with a product that seems cohesive and uh, something you would want to buy, right? But what we can do is we can look at those thousands of requests and we can start mining patterns in the problems that they have. And then we can solve the large swaths of those problems. So for example, one thing in Basecamp 3 is uh, drafts. So somebody will request in Basecamp 2, oh, I'd really like to have drafts for for like um, for messages, right? And they want that just just for that messages. Well, we can step back and see. Oh, if we're re-injecting this thing from scratch, we can build drafts in at a base level, just that everything in the system, including documents and other things, can have this drafts feature, right? And that's an example of trying to solve sort of somebody's pointing at like they're pointing a flashlight, but they're looking through a keyhole to see that problem, right? 
and they can't really see the whole thing, but we can open the damn door. It's just like, hey, you don't have to look through the keyhole. Like, look at the whole swath of this issue and then deal with it there. So customer input, huge part of it. It's driven a bunch of directions, but at an abstract level where somebody requesting a single feature might not immediately be able to recognize that their feature request is actually something that we put into the product. We just we try to attack their problem, not just their request. Right. Pal, do, do you have some? I mean, like we've got plenty of questions uh, in uh, on the Q and A. Yeah, um, like so we can pick up on it on uh, some of those. But uh, and if you do want to ask questions, there's an icon in the top right hand corner of the screen. So um, click that, go to Q and A, and ask questions or vote on some of the ones that have been uh, have been brought up. But uh, Pal, do you go? Uh, yeah. So uh, bringing us back a little bit on subject of the talk and rewriting. You talk a lot about uh, um, how uh, since setting the, the old version is a bad thing and uh, keeping it around as a way to honor your legacy, right? Yep. But then you also say with the new one you target new people. And also you said in, in Basecamp 3 there's not going to be any import um, for older projects. So you got a massive amount of users that love you and would maybe you know there's a percentage of those that would love to go to the new to the new things and they might even go through some pain to switch their old stuff their old data to the new version why prevent that from happening i know that it's not going to map one to one but is that isn't that a risk of them going back into the market I think that's incredibly important. You always have to consider both the practical and the sensibility aspects of your existing customer base because those are the ones who've been with you for, those are the ones who are paying for the new version. If you didn't have all those people paying for the old version, you weren't going to build the new version. So you have to treat that incredibly seriously. And that's what we're actually trying to do with this first no sunset rule. There will not be a sunset for, uh, for a base camp version. We will keep the lights on for as long as uh, anyone wants to use it. So the second aspect of that is then, how do you deal with someone who wants to upgrade, who do want to go along? Um, which, while I think most makers overestimate the number of people who do, there's certainly still a substantial slice of customers who do want to do it. And the way we've decided to do that is um, look at the whole problem. Again, don't look at just the request. The request is, how do I move all my data over? That's not really the problem. Actually, that lead to a lot of problems. We tried that strategy at the last rewrite, and we allowed people to move data over. And what they did was they started moving in-flight projects over. And while that might have worked for the person who moved it over, because they were willing to invest all this time in understanding how the new system worked, it didn't work for any of their collaborators. Everyone was just like, hey, why has everything changed, and why isn't this exactly the same? And you got all those problems that you would have gotten in the same way as if you have forced everyone Sorry, everyone to move over, right? It, it was a mess, and it didn't make anyone happy, even though it, they thought it would. They thought what they wanted was to move all the data over, but it turned out that like they did. Like, it led to more problems. So informed by that past uh, setup, what we've decided to do with the new version is instead say, for all your existing products or projects, all the things that you have going on in flight right now, the worst thing you can do is upset the upper card. Keep those where they are. Then create all of the new stuff. Whenever you start up a new project, whenever you want to start up a new base camp, you do that in the new version. Now, the trick is on us to make that a nice, reasonable experience. I was going to say, one of, one of the product things there in terms is... Of money. So what we're doing is we're basically allowing someone to keep any version of base camp that they had, and if they... Um, just want to keep it around for the archives, just for the in-flight stuff, and not want to create new base camps on those old versions, they can have them for free. So that takes the economic incentive out of, oh, we've got to hurry over and port all over our data over. The second aspect we do is that we have this ID system where you can jump back and forth between the versions of the software as you wish. In fact, that's exactly how we've been running a base camp. We still have uh, projects in base camp 2 that are active and ongoing, and they just continue to update. They just continue to live there. Um, I think that actually lots of customers are used to having various bits of their data in various different systems. It seems on the surface as though, oh, base is just one thing. It should just all be in the same system. And it is to the extent of the logins and jumping back and forth, but it doesn't have to live under the same feature set. 
just like lots of our customers, they'll have one file in like Dropbox. They'll have some important information in their email folder. It turns out that it's, at least from our perspective and our experience, um, more of a problem of the feeling, oh, I want all my data in that same system, and I want to port, port it all over, not so much thinking through what would actually happen, what would day-to-day -day look like if we tried to port over in-flight system or in-flight uh, projects. So that's where we are. Part of it is also just we want to make sure that anyone starting on, on Basecamp 3 uh, do so from a perspective of starting something fresh. Because if you port over something existing, the first thing you're going to notice is all the things that are different or not there. Again, leading you right back into that trap of, uh, of the forced migration and the sunset in the first place, that customers are going to feel like, ah, I can't use this anymore. Like, eh, it doesn't do these things. Oh, I dropped this data. Just not a good experience. Right. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what you've got to realize is this is all a trade-off. You're looking at all the sort of ills that come from not allowing people to do it, weighing those up against sort of alleviating all the main concerns, sort of do I have to pay for two systems or stuff like that? Can I keep my data around? Um, and then just thinking like, uh, on the balance scale, it just has to be better. There's a lot of, I think, decisions that are wrongly cast in either, how do we make this perfect? You, well, you don't. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Uh, migrating, introducing new version of your system is a messy process to some extent, unavoidably so, inherently so, but still totally and absolutely positively worth it. Right. And that's where it's interesting to me. Like, I hate decisions where you can talk about, like, oh, you just got to fight the right answer, as though you can run all the numbers and, like, hey, sir, this is 42 and the other is, is 30. Let's go with 42, right? And it just, most decisions in business and in life, in fact, are not like that. They're around, like, subtly weighing things and figuring out um, which is the better path to go, not because it's overwhelmingly and absolutely better, but because you have weighed all the trade-offs and the consequences it said, Choosing between these two, I choose A. And for us, choosing between not rewriting, continuing to sell not our best, very best ideas, continuing to just be stuck in, uh, in either 2003 or 2010, not an option, right? Like, we don't want that. So we're willing to suffer some pain to avoid that fate. Speaking of pain, maybe my last question. Uh, how do you deal, since you're running two versions of the same software, um, how do you re uh, deal with documentation? How do you avoid people getting confused, you know, searching on your website for something and then they end up in the wrong product version? Great question. Yep, great question. You have to be very diligent about it. We're rolling out a new help site, for example. Um, so it'll be basecamp.com slash help, I think it is. And when you go to that site, we have three screens. You say, are you on Basecamp Classic? Are you on Basecamp 2? Or are you going to be on Basecamp 3? And not just those words, because for a lot of people, they like, what's Basecamp 2? I'm at Basecamp, right? We have a screenshot of what the application looks like. That's and the applications actually look different enough that you can pretty quickly and easily tell, oh, I'm on a different page. But even so, it, it's the same problem that uh, every other software and hardware company since the beginning of time has ever had, right? Like, if you search on how do I do something in Lightroom, and you have Lightroom 5, uh, and the feature is describing a Lightroom 7 feature, well, that's the same problem. If you're trying to think, like, oh, does this uh, 3D touch work on my iPhone? Oh, no, you don't have an iPhone 6. So it doesn't work on that, right? These aren't novel problems in that sense, but they are important problems, and you do have to take them seriously, because it is very easy for someone to get confused. In fact, case in point, Apple... Uh, MacBook, oh, I have a MacBook uh, late 2015, not the, like, slightly two months older one. They didn't name their things. And we actually, in part, made that mistake with the last rewrite, was that we erroneously thought, oh, maybe this is the only rewrite we'll ever do, right? Now we've been disappointed <laughs> that, that idea. So we just called the new version Basecamp, right? Imagine if every iPhone ever was just called iPhone. Uh, it's pretty hard to then distinguish between the versions and the capabilities that they have. So we basically just come back and like, hey, do you know what um, 1975 called? I don't know when the fuck versions was introduced for software. Maybe it was more like the 50s. But that's a good idea, right? It's actually a good idea to version software if it is incompatible, different implementation of the same software. Yeah, there's not going to be like Instagram 2 probably, right? Because 
for them it doesn't make sense to do a full rewrite, they're just doing an evolutionary job. But for us and anyone else who do want to do the full rewrite, just eat it up and go with versions. So what about uh, emails that come in and support? Customers don't know what versions they're in, they're just sending an email to support at baseline.com. Base yep. How do you avoid well, always having that first round trip, yes. oh I'm sorry, what version are you in? Because you might have both looking at your email right. address. <laughs> so we've already solved that issue in the sense that we never just get cold emails. I think you need to level up your support system as, as soon as you have any serious number of emails and the first level up you should do is that you should send the metadata along so that you never have the right round trip. So within Basecamp we have a little tab where you click that and it's a help button and we have a field where you then fill in what your issue is and as part of that form submission what we send along is like what's your name, what's your account ID, which browser are you on, all these bits of information that you would use to help diagnose an issue. You have to sell those along. Don't ask the customer for that. The system already knows. Like they're sitting in front of the system. That's why they're calling you or that's why they're writing you, right? They have a problem. So for the vast majority of all help requests that we get, we get them through that funnel. And that funnel decorates the um, request with all the metadata that's relevant, including which version of Basecamp are you on. Got it. Cool. One more, Pally, or should we pick some from oh, the uh, Q&A? Oh, I have 50 more, but uh, <laughs> let's have the uh, audience, uh, let's give them a chance. Uh, okay, so uh, Nuala again, Nuala Rhodes. Uh, are you planning Basecamp 4 now? Do you have some best ideas which will not make it into Basecamp 3? Absolutely not. Like, I shoot myself right now if I already have to think about like what my software five years from now should should look like. Um, we're trying very hard to get all the best ideas that we have and at least outlines and options on the very best ideas that we could have into this version of the code base. Um, there's nothing fundamental I would say that we're looking at like, oh shit, this is going to be impossible to do in Basecamp 3, that's going to have to wait to Basecamp 4. But I do actually think it is a nice mental trick to know you do not have to get things perfect. I think it's so hard to think if like, oh, if Basecamp 3 was going to be the last version of Basecamp ever and I had to look at this code base for the next hundred years, holy shit, the pressure. Um, now that I know, yes, there will be a Basecamp 4 at some point in the future. It might be four years from now. It might be seven years from now. Who, who knows? But there will be a day. It takes a lot of pressure off getting things perfect, which I think is a healthy place to be. Um, just a, a, a question as an aside. What do you hope is going to be the single thing about Basecamp 3 that your existing user base is going to go, wow, about? What, what's going to be the single thing that they go, wow, about when they come single, into the product? single wow thing from, that you hope your, your customers will just love? What's, what's the thing that's going to make a yep. difference for them? Yeah, it's hard to pick a single thing. I think one of the major changes yeah. we've made have been under the notion of adoptional. So the, one of the top reasons people quit using Basecamp is because they can't get other people to use it with them. And a lot of that is on very simple things. So for example, when you invite someone to Basecamp that they have to go to a form, they have to fill it out, they have to pick a password, and they have to write all that down and remember it or whatever, and then use the system. That's an incredible barrier to entry when people don't care about the system up front. So what we're doing in Basecamp 3 is we're basically allowing someone to get straight into the system without filling out a form. The person who invites them will uh, fill stuff out and they'll get the invitation and then they can get straight into Basecamp. No passwords to pick, no nothing. So that level of adoption, as we call it, I think is going to be a huge deal. Um, second, I'd say that um, it's kind of like a, a two-edged thing. On the one hand, we're rolling out this new version of Basecamp with some incredible mobile apps, the best mobile apps that for sure we've ever made, and I think some of the best mobile apps that I've used. I am literally in the mobile app of uh, Basecamp on either Android or iOS for large swaths of the day. Whenever I go racing or whatever, I'll be in Basecamp like half the day, uh, which is awesome. Now, the flip side of that is that that could be just a tyranny of work. If um, you constantly have your phone buzzing with Basecamp, 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 do this, do this, do this, how do you turn off? So we have this awesome feature called Work Can Wait, which is basically a way to hold all your calls, all your notifications, all your 
anxiety-inducing unread badges on the apps and stuff like that uh, on a schedule. So, for example, after 5 p.m., I'm not reachable by Basecamp anymore. I'll get all those messages when I drop back in in Basecamp tomorrow at 8 a.m., but until then, I'm offline. I think that's, that's really been incredibly nice to be, on the one hand, super reachable. Like, we have ad mentions, for example, in Basecamp. So you mention someone in a, in a to-do item. Um, this happened just the other week. So I was in, in the cab in Japan on the way to, um, to the track, and Ryan had an issue or a question about something that was, was a blocker, right? Like, he was trying to get some feature done, and he just asked in the chat room, hey, David, do you know what this is about? I get a ping on my phone. I swipe it. Boom, I'm in the chat room. I see all the context of, oh, what's your problem? I write him back two lines that clear out that blocker. Now he's no longer blocked on the issue. He can continue to do his work. And I close the app, and I go like, holy fuck, we're living in the future. Like, how could that happen before? Um, that would have been such a different process of, oh, he'd have to send me an email. He'd have to recap the context. He'd have to do all this stuff, right? And then at the same time, um, being on different sort of time zone and everything, I flip the app to work and wait, and then I don't get anything from it. It doesn't bug me at dinner. It doesn't bug me when I'm playing with cold. It doesn't bug me at any of these other times where work should just wait. Uh, I think it's really a nice duality, and I think a lot of people are going to take to that and see, oh, wow, that, that makes a big difference in my life. So this is the, it's the antithesis of just about every app I have on my uh, phone. So um, I'm easily distracted, very easily distracted. And the first thing I do is switch off every notification for everything. And then I get an update on the thing uh, on, my, uh, on Android. So I get, a, I get a new version of Android. And lo and behold, every single app has switched all the notifications right. back on. And that distracts me for about a day, just turning them all off, actually. And it's shit. Um, it's shit for everyone. I think it's terrible. We live under this journey of uh, everyone wants engagement. They want 100% engagement, and not everyone can have 100% engagement. Not everyone should. Like, if you have 20 apps that all want 100% engagement, they're going to tear you to shreds. They're going to tear your life to shreds. Uh, I think it's it's such a double-edged sword to have notifications have and have this engagement pool and, and drips and everything that everyone wants a piece of you uh, when you just got to realize that's not a good life. So we try to push back against that. Work and wait is a major aspect of that, that uh, Basecamp should be respectful of when work is over. And like, uh, Basecamp doesn't need 100% of your engagement 100% of the time. That's very un Silicon Valley of you, David. Um, surely, surely everybody wants to work 24-7-365. 366 in the Um Maybe that's a different way of doing things. It will never take off, you know. Um, there are a bunch of there are a bunch of questions here about uh, actually learning and lifestyle. But I'm I'm conscious that we've uh, we've had an hour of your time, and and um, that's that's really interesting. Uh, and, and and you know your your time is valuable. I'd love to suggest maybe to that, that we invite you back at some point and talk about some of the things around learning. I think some people are really fascinated about. Your experience as a racing driver. There was a, certainly a, a question about um, why you did it the way that you did, because actually it means that you spent five or six years getting your ass whooped uh, every time you went on a track because you were you were kind of leveling up. There are a number of things about uh, lifestyle and looking after yourself. So um, perhaps if we uh, if we pull a, a couple of other other people together to, to talk about that another time. That would be uh, that would be really interesting if you'd be uh, up for that. Um, Peldy, have you got anything to finish up with? Uh, nothing. I think we're out of time. So I'd just like to uh, thank you, Mark, for having me, and thank uh, David for everything he's been doing for my my kind of software industry, not not the other kind. Uh, thanks for continuously uh, leading the way for us. We're, we're all we're all unicorns. Look, I'm a unicorn now. Um, I prefer this cushion. There you go. Um, David, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate your time. Peldy, thank you very much indeed for uh, taking part. This will go up as a YouTube video. Uh, we'll also put it on the, uh, the, the the talk page and that kind of stuff. But um, you've both been absolutely fantastic. Um, I know it's quite late there. 
where you are, Peldy, so you're eating into family time. Please wa wish Guido Jack a happy birthday. He's <laughs> 10 <laughs> this week. <laughs> so, very, very major milestone in everybody's uh, life. I remember when I was 10 and actually thought I was adult. Um, haven't grown up anymore since then. But uh, David, thanks so much. Great to see you. And uh, really good luck with Basecamp 3.0. We have a URL for that, basecamp.com. Three, that's the number or the digit hyphen is hyphen coming you haven't really released it to the world yet but uh, it's coming in the next few days isn't it so it's very um, shortly we'll start rolling it out to a small number of people and try to gauge whether we've totally screwed it up or whether something's working so yeah if you sign up at uh, basecamp.com slash uh, three is coming then um, you'll be one of the first to give it a try and um, before we roll it out to everyone. And thank you both for, for having me. I love talking about oh, this stuff. Yeah. Pleasure, pleasure. And uh, it's, pleasure. it's always, a, uh, it's always, always fun to uh, talk with people who um, have a view and uh, are trying to do things differently. So have a fantastic time. And uh, Peldy, are you off to uh, rewrite your code base? Uh, if, I, if I was, I wouldn't tell you because I just learned you have to keep it secret. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Take very good care. Thanks so much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.